Good morning, everybody. Glad you're here. So John, who owns the drums, let me borrow them on Friday and take them to the university. And he's had drums for our worship time there for like the first time. One of the students played it. I brought it back here, and um, do you think I know how to put it back together again? <laughs> no. So I'm going to play the guitar, <laughs> and we'll talk to John, and he'll come and put his drums back together again. We are glad you're here this morning. Thanks for coming. And let's pray together, shall we? Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we have to be in your house and to worship you and to hear from you and to focus our hearts and our minds and our lives on you. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to lay aside the weights that we may have brought with us today Pray, Lord, you would forgive us for the things that we've done that have hurt others, hurt you, hurt ourselves. Forgive us, Lord, for the things this week that we failed to do that we should have done. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness and your grace and your mercy. And I pray, Lord, that this day that, uh, that we would connect with you, that we would hear from you, and that we would leave this place in some way changed. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand as we sing the first song of the Advent season, the first song of our, our journey towards Christmas this year. And like many years, our first song is, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Let's speak together the words of prophecy 
that we uh, find in scripture as people were pointing towards the coming of Christ. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant, whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And then in the New Testament, we read uh, the beginning of the fulfillment of that prophecy. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. Please be seated. In those passages, we see hints of generations of prophets who were pointing our attention towards the coming of Christ, of this fulfillment of this phase of God's plan to restore humanity to the place from which we had fallen. Prophets like Malachi and Isaiah and David and the other psalmists and, and Micah and Hosea and Zechariah all pointed us towards the Christ. And today, we remember hope. Nathan and Rachel are going to come and light the candle of hope for us. And as that candle burns throughout our service today, it's a visual reminder of us to look forward, to remember and to expect good things. Let's all speak together the prayer that will be on the screen as they're lighting the candle. God of infinite grace, you fill us with joyful expectation. Make us ready for the message that prepares the way. Grant us hope beyond our limited imaginations. May we eagerly anticipate and await the kingdom of your Son, Jesus Christ, who reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Let's pray a prayer of intercession for our world. A prayer of intercession is where we ask God on behalf of the world around us, of the people around us, for the good things. Please just, you know, close your eyes. And listen to this prayer and let it sink into your heart as we pray together. God of hope, like John the baptizer, we direct others towards the hope of the one to come. As we joyfully await the glorious coming of Christ, we pray to you for the needs of the church and of the world. We pray in intercession for hope, hope in the midst of loss, hope in the midst of despair, hope in the midst of the unknown, hope in the midst of struggling health. Hear our humble prayer that we may serve you by pointing others to the true hope found in Christ. And may we do so with joy until the day of the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen.
So yeah, if you haven't figured out by now, this is the first Sunday of Advent. The four weeks in the church calendar where we move to prepare for the birth of Jesus Christ at Christmas time. Ken walked in this morning and he said to us, Happy New Year. And we were kind of like, what? <laughs> what do you mean Happy New Year? And he reminded me, this is the first, this is the start of the church calendar, right? This is the start of the 12-month cycle of the church calendar this, this Sunday. Part of the tradition in this celebration is the lighting of Advent candles, which we did earlier, and we'll do that every week until Christmas. Now, the four weeks of Advent hope focus on the four themes of hope, peace, joy, and love. And this morning's focus is a focus of hope, hope that can be found in the coming of the Christ child, but also hope to be found not only in the past, but also in the future as well. One of the scripture passages that sometimes is read when lighting the Advent candle of hope is found in Lamentations, which is a small book in the Old Testament, just after Jeremiah. Lamentations chapter 3 says this, But this I call to mind, and then therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope. In the Lord. We find hope in God's love. We find hope in his mercy. We find hope in his faithfulness. But this morning we want to focus on the fact that we can find hope not only in the first advent of Christ when he was born a baby in a manger, but in his second advent as well, which is to come. On this first Sunday of Advent, we find hope not only in the fact that Jesus came to Bethlehem 2,100 years ago, but also in the fact that Jesus is coming again as the risen Lord and King. Now, hope can be something quite, quite, uh, quite fragile, something that we can lose sight of and, and lose our grip of in today's world. Our thoughts and emotions can sometimes be tempted to edge towards despair. The third verse of my favorite Christmas carol, which I'm sure we'll sing at some point between now and Christmas, is, is the carol is called, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. And the third verse is kind of the pivot of the whole carol, and it points, it paints a realistic, if not discouraging, picture of how we can sometimes feel in today's world. And the third verse says, And in despair I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And the remainder of that carol, and the story of Christmas itself, reminds us that there is hope, that Jesus came to save us, that he rose again to live with us and in us, and in in coming again, and he's coming again to put an end to all sin, an end to all wrong, and to, to bring us to be with God the Father forever. Christmas is a tremendous reminder of that hope in a world that sometimes makes hope hard to find. Uh, Thompson, in his reference Bible, lists four situations that we face in life, kind of borrow his outline a bit, um, which people in the Old Testament faced and which can bring discouragement to us and even at its extreme, even hopelessness sometimes. First, we can become hopeless because the way is hard. The children of Israel wandering in the desert for years, unable to reach the promised land, they were given to despair and hopelessness because the way was difficult. It was hard. The path that God had asked them to walk was not an easy one. And some of their stubborn choices along the way didn't make things any easier. And at times in our lives, we have a path put in front of us that we have to walk that can be very hard and very challenging. A path that could look overwhelming and even from our vantage point, impossible. It can be placed in our lives through no fault of our own, like an, through an illness or a death in the family or, or the loss of a job or a wayward child. Sometimes we find ourselves in, on a hard path because of our own uh, misguided choices. Either way, we wonder how we can possibly find the strength to walk this arduous path. Secondly, Thompson writes that we are given to despair and hopelessness because of the difficulty of one particular task itself. And he uses the example of Nehemiah and the people of Israel who were given the task of rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem after it had been destroyed. 
So perhaps it's not a long, arduous path that we're facing, but rather just one task, but it's a biggie, and it's just overwhelming, like, like moving. I remember reading a list sometimes of the most stressful things in life, and moving was like right up there, right along public speaking. <laughs> right, I think right after phys physical illness, moving is a stressful thing, changing jobs, quitting smoking or uh, some other habit that drains you of your life, going off to college, passing that class that has just been the bane of your existence. Sometimes when the task that we know we have to perform seems like a mountain in front of us, the temptation is to just kind of give up. Just throw our hands in the air, throw in the towel, give up in despair. Third reason Thompson gives for hopelessness is the prosperity of the wicked. Here he points to many psalms. We see this throughout the psalms, where the psalmist comes before God and wonders, why are these bad people prospering while the righteous people seem to be ignored or seem to be trampled underfoot. And sometimes we can look around and see so many people, friends or neighbors, family members, and just see them kind of getting ahead in life or getting along well materially or financially or, and in many ways getting along much better than, than you and I are. And we fall into the trap of comparison and allowing comparisons to, to dictate our identity to dictate our emotions and our reactions and our responses, kind of like what we were saying with Rob's prayer request, that comparison can make things seem much, much worse. And we begin to feel hopeless of ever getting ahead. And we can start to question ourselves, wondering, well, why did I do things properly? Why did I do things, why did I stay on the right path when so many others have, um, have so much who are living their lives, if not out of wickedness, like the Psalms would say, but they're not including God. They're kind of ignoring God and putting him on the sidelines, and yet they're doing so well. And obsessing over these comparisons can sometimes breed hopelessness. Finally, Thompson says that hopelessness can set in because of a delay of fulfillment of promises and of our own desires. He refers to Proverbs thirteen twelve, which says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. We live in an era of instant gratification, an era of fast food and microwavable dinners, an era of push-button machines and the internet, of Google and Wikipedia. Everything is at our fingertips, and if we don't get what we're looking for immediately, when we don't get what we want right away, we become annoyed. And living in an environment like this, we become more impatient. In ancient times, the writer of Proverbs examined human nature and declared that when we have to, to put getting our hopes fulfilled, when we, when we don't get what we hope for in a timely manner, and in fact have to wait a very long time, the writer of Proverbs says it makes our hearts sick. If that was the case in ancient times, how much more is it in today's world? when we put off the fulfillment of our hopes and dreams. And that can lead to despair. It could lead even to hopelessness. If it takes us more time than we would like to finish our degree, it takes us more time than we'd like to find a spouse, to become financially secure, to find that dream job, to see our kids get saved, we begin to wonder, well, will it happen ever? Will it ever happen at all? And we begin to doubt God, and we're given to hopelessness and despair. Whether in our lives we've experienced feelings of hopelessness because of the hardness of the way, the difficulty of the task, the prosperity of the wicked, or because of a delay in fulfillment of hopes, the message of this first Sunday of Advent in all of these situations is that there is hope. There is hope that we can find in the past, as written for us in scriptures. Romans 15.4 says, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. The scriptures tell us about the lives of real people who had faith. The scriptures are full of biographies of people, real people with real lives who were strong in their faith and yet who also had times of despair where they lost hope. And in the scriptures, we see the real ways that God delivered them in their lives, the real ways that God worked in their lives. And since our God is unchanging, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, we can be encouraged that the God who worked in the lives of those people we read about in scripture 
can do the same thing in our lives today. Knowing that help and deliverance will come can give us the patience and the strength to endure. There's hope that we find in the past, and there's hope that we find in the present through the promise of our salvation. Hebrews 6.19 tells us, We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where Jesus went before us. Who went before us has entered on our behalf. So the imagery here is of the Old Testament temple. And we've talked about this before, but there's this huge, huge temple that would separate the holy place from the holy of holies. And it was a thick, thick, almost like a carpet rather than a curtain. And, and once a year, a priest would go behind the curtain and make a sacrifice for the sins of all the people. And Jesus, through his death on the cross, became that eternal sacrifice for our sins. One of the first things that happened, the scriptures tell us, after Jesus died on the cross, is that curtain in the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom, something that a human could not have done because it was so thick, and also it was ridiculously tall too, but it was God's symbolizing to us that because of what Jesus has done, the veil is torn and we can enter into the most holy place with God. He, he Jesus, went behind the curtain on our behalf and destroyed that curtain so we could be forgiven and so we could be saved. And our salvation, our position before God is an anchor that holds on strong through the storms of life. As a free gift of God's grace accepted by faith, our salvation is a hope we can rest in a hope that is firm and secure in the midst of trials and difficulties of life. But as we said before, the main focus of the first Sunday of Advent is the hope we have not just in the past, in the present, but in the future. We have a hope in the promise that just as Jesus came once as a baby in the manger, he will come again to ultimately fulfill the full promise of our salvation. This hope not only impacts our future, but it has an effect on how we live our lives today. John 1, 1 John 3, 3 says, We shall see him as he is, and that when he appears, we shall be like him. And that's the goal, our goal as Christians, to become Christ-like, to become more and more like Christ, as God, by his Spirit, molds us and guides us and teaches us. And God's intention is that we will grow in Christ-likeness more and more until he appears again when we shall be like him. Not, you know, transformed into little gods like some religions believe, but be like him in that we are free from the presence of sin, free to be the people that he created us to be from the beginning of time. A Christian singer from years ago named Wayne Watson wrote a lot of really good songs, and he sings a song about heaven called One Day. And the chorus goes like this. One day Jesus will call my name. As days go by, I hope I don't stay the same. I want to get so close to him that there's no big change on that day when Jesus calls my name. That chorus just gives the idea of progressive growth, becoming more and more like Jesus so that at the end of our days, whether it's when we die or when Jesus comes again and we are entered into the presence of God, it just becomes the natural progression of a life well-lived, a life lived in following, in following Christ. First John tells us that this hope of his appearing and of being like Jesus is a hope that leads us to live purer lives. The hope of what we will become pushes us towards living a life that first of all ensures that we'll arrive at our destination well, and secondly pushes us towards living a life that gets closer and closer to being like Jesus. In Acts 24, Paul talks about the hope of our resurrection at the end of time. He tells his hearers, I have the same hope in God as these men that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and men. The hope of the second advent compels us to live life with a clear conscience. And that means, as my mom always used to tell us, keep short accounts with God. If you've messed up, and you've hurt God, you've sinned, you've hurt God, you've hurt others, hurt yourselves, don't drag it out. Just go to God and ask for forgiveness 
and ask him to help you start over again. It means living a life where we're willing to engage in self-examination. Socrates once said, the unexamined life is not worth living. That may be a little extreme, but you get the point. From a more godly point of view, we need to daily examine our lives, search our hearts, and allow God to put his finger on things that, that might need to change, that might need to be out of our lives, put his finger on things in our lives that we might need to improve on, and ask him for forgiveness where needed. Ask him for strength where needed to move forward in living a holy life. And we need to keep short accounts with people as well, seeing if we've offended or hurt anyone and asking for forgiveness, and doing whatever it takes on our part to make it right. Scripture says, as, as far as it depends upon you, live at peace with everyone. We can't control what other people will do, but we can control what we can do. And as far as it depends on us, let's do what we can to keep short accounts with others. The hope of the second advent it leads us to live purer lives. It leads us to keep a clear conscience. And thirdly, it teaches us to say no to worldly passions. Titus chapter 2 says this, For the grace of God which brings salvation has appeared to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. By God's grace, we can learn to say no. No to the ways of this world that, that, that feed our selfish desires. No to the ways of this world that feed our inclination to want to live in a world where, where right and wrong is blurred, in a world that tells us, well, if we think it's okay, then it must be okay. And then we can just do whatever we want. We're made for more than that. We were made to live a better life than that. We are made to look forward with joyful anticipation to the second advent and to begin even now to live what the hymn writer calls a foretaste of glory divine, to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives so that at the second advent when we step into the full presence of God, there will, in a sense, be no big change. It will only seem like the logical next step of a life lived for the glory of God. The hope of the second advent is a hope that we need to be encouraged by, not just at Christmas, but the whole year round. So as we embark on a hard path or a difficult task, as we wonder about the prosperity of others who ignore God or, or wonder about what seems to be a delay in God's part in coming to our rescue and helping us, we know that God has given us hope. Hope that speaks to us from the past, through scriptures that encourage us, hope that speaks to us in the present through the anchor that we have in the surety of our salvation, and hope that speaks to our future, the hope that we shall one day see him as he is and be fully in his presence and become the creation that he made us to be. And that hope of the second advent motivates us to live pure and holy lives with a clear conscience before the Lord, in this, we are to be encouraged both by the Holy Spirit and be encouraged by each other. Listen to what 1 Thessalonians 4 says. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Encourage one another. Jesus will come again, and we are to be in anticipation of his returning. Now, that doesn't mean we simply give up on life and just go and find a cabin up there on some mountain and just live like a hermit and just say, okay, Jesus, I'm here. I'm waiting. I'm ready. Come and get me. No, Jesus very specifically said, occupy until I come. 
He's given us a task. He's given us a job to do. And he wants us to live in anticipation of his coming while at the same time doing what he's called us to do here. We're to be busy doing the work of the Lord, busy allow, allowing Jesus to work through us to bless others and to lead them to, to himself and to build more and more of himself in us. But as we do, we are to look forward to that time when we will be with the Lord forever. May that thought encourage us and lift, help lift us out of any times of, of hopelessness that we might encounter in our lives. And may we encourage ourselves in this, and may we encourage each other. The early Christians had a particular greeting that they would share with each other whenever they would see each other, and it was the word Maranatha. Maranatha, which meant the Lord is coming. So instead of saying, hi, how you doing? They would say, hey, the Lord is coming. Or even so, come, Lord. Encourage one another with this hope, however you want to do it. Maranatha, the Lord is coming back again. And just as sure as Jesus came as a baby in a manger at Christmas to bring us salvation, so he will come again to fulfill the full promise of our salvation, to bring about the full realization of our hope. In our times when we're tempted to feel hopeless, in our times when we're tempted to feel despair, May we remind ourselves and may we remind each other that the second advent will surely happen. Jesus is coming again, and we will be with the Lord forever. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, thank you for coming this, the first time 2,000 years ago. and Thank you for all that means to us now, that it's not, it's not just an event in history past, but that because you've risen again and sent your Holy Spirit, it impacts our lives today. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. And we thank you for the promise of what's to come. We thank you, Lord, for your, your, your presence with us today. Thank you, Lord, for your salvation, for your spirit that walks with us through the difficult tasks, through the difficult path, through times when we're tempted to compare ourselves to others and, and begin to feel sorry for ourselves through those times that, um, where there's a delay and we wonder when, when are you going to come and help. We thank you, Lord, that you walk with us through all of those times and you will never leave us nor forsake us. We thank you for that hope. And we thank you, Lord, for the hope of the future. We know that this world is not all there is, that there is a life to come, and that through our salvation and through the blood of Jesus Christ, we can enter into to that salvation in a new and living way. And that we have that hope of being free from the presence of sin, free from illness, free from disease, free from anger and hate, and just living in your presence forever. And so may that, that, um, that knowledge, that promise, may we be constantly reminded of that. And may that impact, Lord, the way we live. May it just encourage us to live pure and holy lives. May it encourage us, us, us to live with a clear conscience before you. May it encourage us to share the truth of your love and your gospel with others so that they too can have that hope and not be given to despair and hopelessness this Christmas. Lord, help us. Give us a heart for those around who, who are feeling the total opposite of what they should be feeling at Christmas. Help us, Lord, to be able to share with others the hope of the baby in the manger and the hope of your presence with them today and the hope of the reality of your coming again. Constantly, Lord, remind us of that hope in those times when we need it. And we thank you and praise you, Lord, for the hope that you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen.
we continue to sing.